my name is Claire Murray. I'm a lecturer in the Faculty and Department of Law in University College Cork in Ireland. I've always been interested in women's issues and women's rights concerns anyway, but um, when I was an undergraduate law student in University College Cork, I took a module that was called Welfare Law. And in Welfare Law, part of what we covered was Irish Mental Health Law. And at the time, the governing legislation in Ireland was the Mental Treatment Act 1945 which isn't to say I'm that old, but the 1945 Act was actually in place until 2006 in Ireland. So under the 1945 Act, it was quite paternalistic and the procedures for involuntary committal were, there weren't a lot of safeguards. It was on the say-so of a GP and a family member often. So we covered a number of cases under the 1945 Act, a lot of them involving women being involuntarily committed by their husbands or other male family members. Um, there was one particular case, O'Reilly and Moroni, where a woman was having marital difficulties and her husband and her father went to the locum general practitioner and said, we think there's difficulties here. And so the GP went and stood at the foot of the driveway to her house and watched her interact with her husband from the driveway and on that basis deemed that she required involuntary committal and treatment for a mental disorder. And I found this shocking <laughs> and appalling. Um, and it went all the way to the Supreme Court and the Irish Supreme Court by a majority in the O'Reilly and Moroni case deemed that that was a sufficient examination for the purposes of the 1945 Act so that you didn't actually have to physically examine the person or talk to them even, that it was sufficient. Um, so I found that quite upsetting and it interested me in the area of mental health and looking at the human rights issues and the difficulties with involuntary committal and the lack of safeguards, but also wondering whether there was a gendered dimension there and whether women were disproportionately impacted by the Irish mental health system. Um, as my research progressed, I discovered that actually wasn't the case um, in Irish mental health. More men than women are actually involuntarily admitted. But that's not to say that there aren't gendered issues and there isn't a role for feminist theory. But I suppose that developed as my research developed. But initially, that was the kicking off point, I suppose, that exposure to the difficulties with the mental health system. As I said, the, the law subsequently changed as well, so it's, we're no longer governed by the 1945 Act. But in a nice kind of coming full circle, I now teach welfare law in UCC, where I took it as an undergraduate student. And I still tell the students about that case, as, but as background information, I suppose, now, rather than as the, the law currently stands. But you still get the same reaction from a lot of students as I had, you know, kind of, shock that that was happening in Ireland so recently. As I said, it's not as straightforward as more women are admitted than men. And that became obvious to me quite early on in my research. But one of the issues that has become apparent is that we've moved from this paternalistic 1945 Act to the Mental Health Act 2001, which is the current governing legislation, which, as I said, was not enacted until 2006. So in Ireland, we ostensibly have a rights-based model, and that's consistent with a number of other jurisdictions, including the United States and the United Kingdom. And the Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities at international law now is very much focused on a rights-based model. And I suppose my current research interest is looking at the nature of that rights-based model, what kind of rights-based model it is, and what rights are being protected, and whether it's sufficient or whether it could be improved, um, and looking at feminist theories of rights in order to assess maybe where some of the difficulties are and where an improvement might be possible. So, the current model of mental health law in Ireland under the 2001 Act is a very 
traditional liberal rights-based model. Mm, it's different to your liberal rights-based model here in the US, ours is more procedural, but they're both grounded in that traditional liberal understanding of rights discourse. So Kantian and Rawlsian rights discourse based on this abstract individual subject who is absent characteristics and doesn't exist in relation to others. So that's the kind of subject at the heart of traditional liberal rights discourse which underpins the rights-based models of mental health law. Feminist theories of rights and feminist critiques of traditional rights discourse dispute that idea of the abstract individual who exists without connections to others and without characteristics. So feminist theories of rights would argue that everyone is a situated subject, that you're situated in terms of characteristics and that you exist in relation to others. Um, and I suppose that's where some of Professor Feynman's work on the vulnerable subject is very interesting to me, that idea of moving from that traditional liberal rights subject to that vulnerable subject. And feminist theories of rights also draw attention to the fact that traditional liberal rights discourse is involved in drawing boundaries and delimiting boundaries, and that delimiting those boundaries is a political act. So when you decide who is a right subject and who isn't a right subject, who's inside the boundary, who's outside the boundary, where you draw those boundaries is a political act and it has consequences for people. So where someone is situated in respect of that boundary impacts on their lives. And there are a number of intersectional factors that contribute to where someone is situated in respect of that boundary. And what I'm particularly interested in at the moment is looking at feminist theories in relation to boundaries in rights discourse and the jagged impact of those boundaries. So it's not always black and white, inside the boundary good, outside the boundary bad. Very often it's more nuanced than that and there are both positives and negatives to being either inside or outside those boundaries and looking at what those are in the context of mental health law in particular. Um, so, I mean, there are, I'm using feminist theories of rights quite broadly. I mean, there are a number of theorists w whose work I've drawn on, Professor Feynman being one of a number of them, also Martha Minow, Siobhan Mullally, Annette Bayer, you know, so there's a number of theorists there. Um, so essentially, th that's what I'm looking at. So it's not so much a how does mental health law impact more on one gender or the other, but it's looking at feminist theories of rights and how they could be applied in the context of mental health law to maybe ensure that you have a fuller and more engaged and more effective rights-based model. Ostensibly, we've moved from the paternalistic model of the 1945 Act in Ireland to the rights-based model of the Mental Health Act 2001. But there are still vestiges of paternalism in operation in the system. Um, and I, I've written about this before, particularly focused on an Irish context, but it's very difficult to, to just change the law and assume that that means that the operation of the entire system will change like that. It doesn't work like that. So even though we have the legal framework is a rights-based model, now it may be a very simplistic, it is a very simplistic rights-based model based on the liberal subject, very much just focused on autonomy and liberty. So we have a procedural review of detention to ensure that it's still necessary to address the liberty issue and a second opinion system in place if treatment is going to be imposed without consent. So you have second opinion from another doctor. So it's still quite medically controlled, but there is a second opinion system there. So it's focused on liberty and autonomy. It's a very simplistic rights-based model, but it is a rights-based model. However, in practice, at the operational level, there are still aspects of paternalism. So you have on the ground, for example, in the operation of the system, staff working in the mental health system who are not ensuring that there is a treatment program or treatment plan in place for all involuntary patients. There's a difficulty with seclusion and restraint still being used without being a 
appropriately monitored or recorded. So things like that, that the Mental Health Commission and the legislation have put procedures in place to address because there's a concern that they could violate people's rights on the ground are not always being adhered to properly. Or there's a treatment plan, plan in place, but it's not followed. So it's there kind of to tick the box, but maybe not. Now that's not across the board, but it is a difficulty and it has been noted repeatedly by the reports of the Inspectorate of Mental Health Services in Ireland, which monitors the implementation of the Act. Um, in addition to those, that continuing element of paternalism on the ground and the day-to-day -day interaction between service users and service providers, there's also a level of paternalism in the approach of the judiciary in Ireland to the operation of the mental health system and the implementation of the mental health legislation. So even though the Act says it's changed from a paternalistic to a rights-based model, the courts still tend to conceive of it as a paternalistic piece of legislation and there to protect sick people who are in need of care and treatment. And so they're willing to overlook certain breaches of rights which perhaps in another context may not be brushed under the carpet so quickly but because it's in that context and they see it as paternalistic legislation they tend to ignore it so we only have one supreme court decision on mental health in ireland to date following the implementation of the 2001 act and that is the eh case and that decision very much reinforces that paternalistic intent so the subtext of the judgment which isn't hidden particularly deeply is that this lady the plaintiff was ill was in need of treatment and really that's what the act is there to deal with and so it's not appropriate it i mean the the judgment actually says even though the act provides that someone should be appointed a legal counsel that shouldn't be seen as an encouragement to rush to court in all events because you know it's a paternalistic legislation which is concerning I suppose to be to be coming from the court um, now not all judges have approached it like that and there are some examples notable examples of a less paternalistic approach but they've been at the high court level the supreme court decision which is obviously the the binding precedent is quite paternalistic so as I said even though you have that move in theory perhaps in practice there is absolutely still an element of paternalism So I've been using Professor Feynman's work in my research, both her work on boundaries and also um, her more recent work on vulnerabilities, and found it very useful. So I was aware of her work and I was aware of the existence of the project. There's also a link between University College Cork and Professor Feynman and the Feminism and Legal Theory Project in particular at Emory. So a number of my colleagues have spent time here as visiting scholars or attending workshops or conferences um, and they all had spoken very highly of it and felt that it was very beneficial and a, an exciting place um, to spend time so it, it, it came with good recommendations um, I suppose also I was very particularly interested and attracted to the possibility of accessing the feminism and legal theory project archive so it's fantastic to be able to go and read the workbooks of all the various workshops to be able to see the kinds of work that were being presented to be able to see actually how feminist theory has developed over time and the issues that continue to recur and also the things that seem to have maybe been parked for a while and how the issues that are concerning feminist legal theorists are moving on so I was really interested to explore that when I came and I, I found it very beneficial. And in addition to the workbooks, there's also access to the DVD collection, so the, the videoing of the various workshops and the ability to, often it's in the discussions following the paper that you really see actually theories crystallise and solidify and take shape and that's very exciting to watch um, and it's also hugely informative and beneficial. Um, so I suppose the fact that I, I, I was familiar with the, the project and the benefits of attending Emory and also that particular research tool and archive that was available here, they were the particular factors that attracted me to come and spend some time here.
So I found the community here at Emory Law to be really welcoming and facilitating. I have to say I found that people were extremely generous with their time, that they were willing to go out of their way to set aside time to meet with me, to discuss their research and their work with me, to clarify any issues that I might have in relation to particular theoretical concepts or the operation of the American legal system in the context of mental health law. Um, so people were extremely generous in, in giving me their time and they were also extremely interested in my work and in discussing my work with me and to consider how my work will contribute to the broader discussion on feminist legal theory, on rights and, and vulnerabilities. Um, I find the, the resources here are fantastic. The, the library is a brilliant resource. Um, the materials were really accessible. People were extremely helpful. I, I think particularly would like to mention the support of the IT staff and the library staff here who were incredibly helpful to me and very patient with me. Um, so I have to say that the, the facilities have been brilliant and as I said the, the archive from the Feminism and Legal Theory Project has been a particularly useful resource for me. Also people were very um, welcoming and encouraged me to partake in a number of seminars and conferences and workshops that were taking place during my time here. So I found those all really informative and engaging and beneficial even if they weren't directly connected to my area of research, the, the ability to just read work and engage with work by other feminist scholars in cutting edge areas of law was really exciting. Um, and I suppose particularly, I, I, my work is most connected, I suppose, to Professor Feynman's work and also to Professor Annie Satz's work. And so they've really been very generous um, in spending time with me. Um, so overall, it's been a really wonderful experience. I felt very welcome. I really feel part of the, the community here at Emory, and I absolutely would recommend anyone considering um, coming as a visiting scholar that it's, it's well worth it and extremely beneficial. I'm, at present, I'm working on a particular paper on that issue of boundaries in mental health law and the, the consequences of boundaries and the jagged impact of those boundaries. And so a lot of the research on feminist theories and the, you know, my deeper understanding of the vulnerability theory has been particularly helpful in that context. So the academic work I've done here will immediately impact on that particular short-term project that I am engaged in at the moment. But long term, I, I mean, I have a series of other articles that I, I will be working on. And so generally improving my understanding and grasp of American mental health law and feminist theory has been, you know, will benefit all of those subsequent projects as well. In particular, my work to date has been quite focused on Irish mental health law with a comparative aspect looking at England and Wales but I want to expand that and to include other comparators so the ability to be here to research in a US library on US mental health law and to speak to people who have an understanding of it um, really has deepened my understanding of the US model of mental health law um, and I actually think it's a very effective comparison because your liberal rights-based model is even more traditionally liberal than ours and is very structured and has a very high threshold um, in order to permit involuntary admission um, and again is very focused on liberty and autonomy rights and isn't too concerned with looking outside of that. So I think that that's been extremely beneficial to me um, and actually it will be really helpful in my teaching work as well because as I said I do now teach um, welfare law which includes disability rights and mental health as part of the curriculum for that module and I, again I think just my greater understanding of the comparative aspects and the lessons that can be learned from other jurisdictions um, is very helpful in I suppose explaining how Irish mental health law and Irish disability law is situated in a broader context so I think it will benefit my time here will benefit not just me but also my students as well.